I just want to take a moment and talk about why we want to do this. The idea of having people share their personal struggles is because in our business, I get to speak to people that have various health conditions in the day to day. And often, the common theme amongst these people are that they feel isolated and they feel alone in their condition. And to me, being on the receiving end of it, I think to myself, I've just spoken to three people that have the same condition as you do today. So I'm hoping that through having these conversations with people and them sharing their personal struggles, we can empower those with hope, with guidance, and even speak about some of the pitfalls that they might face down the line. That's why we do it. You're telling yourself that you're the victim. Body dysmorphia, I don't think, is a unheard of topic. My body was telling me that something's wrong. Were you just kind of gut feeling it out? Like you, you took enough to make sure you weren't feeling much pain? I don't realize what's going on in the moment. My mom is in shock. My brother's I was too scared to look. And the doctor initially didn't think it was a severed tendon. The doctors told me that I'll never walk again. Everything you do it just feeds into your identity. Some injuries you have to recover from mentally. Right. Hi, Kevin. Uh, thanks for being a part of this today. I really appreciate it. Getting straight into it, Kevin, tell me what is wrong with you? Hi, my name's Kevin, and the doctors told me that I'll never walk again. So that's quite a bold statement, I'll never walk again. Um, a lot to unpack. And I think to unpack that, I know we have spoken about this before, so I really want to get back to the beginning of where this all started. So it started when I was a teenager, um, early adolescence. I come from a family that has a history of um, obesity, um, heart disease and a few other things, um, diabetes. So I was the chubbier kid in the, in the room in most conversations. And I was the youngest that had the body of the biggest. And mm. that exposed me to a lot of um, insecurities regarding my body. I had a family that would be very good at sheltering me from reality and as much as they protected me I got into an environment where I was bullied in mm. high school um, and I distinctly remember that experience being one of the catalysts for me wanting to change because as a young impressionable boy you don't know what you know until yeah. you question everything um, I, think, I think that that part of your life is quite interesting I mean when we think about kids they can be incredibly cruel. And we know this. Every human is, is, can relate to that statement. Um, and body dysmorphia, I don't think, is a unheard of topic as someone who's young, especially, like you said, you were overweight as a child. So when we talk about this bullying and the body dysmorphia you were feeling, was there a day where you, re where you reached the peak? There was a significant day in the locker room. We're getting ready for after-school activities, and so we're all getting changed in the same mm. space. And I just remembered the way that everyone just looked at me and the comments that were made. To be explicit, they just made fun of my breasts mm. because they, they were like, obviously, your cup size is bigger than my sister's. And right. At a, I'm in grade 9 at this point. Um, I'm 14 years old, and... In that moment, all of that shame comes mm. to you. you. You really start to look into yourself. I just allowed myself to reflect on it when I got home. And the one decision I made was that this will never happen again. Yeah, that, that is what I like about it. I mean, the, obviously the situation is, is awful and um, it cuts incredibly deep, especially when you're in a developmental stage of your life. It's just pivotal. Like it, it's everything you do, it just feeds into your identity as a person and someone says something like that um, and obviously everyone's laughing uh, I, I can imagine you felt quite small but what I really like about this is when I, when I asked you about this you said that you were actually quite appreciative of the bullying because it made you change and the, the quote that comes to mind when I heard you tell me this was that the pain when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, that's when you change. But then now tell me that you, you then decided this will never happen again. How, how did you actually go about changing? I think you just commit um, for myself. I always thought that I needed to have a plan in life. Mm -hmm. And when it came to that moment, I just told myself that 
you need to figure it out more than right. anything. I had access to people that could I could rely on in terms of what a diet looked like, what a routine looks like, and I could leverage YouTube and all these other tools, but I just had that mentality that I'm just going to walk to the gym after school every day. I just told myself that every day you need to do one thing to get to a, p- a position of change more than anything. That's um, huge. So it's just utterly committed. Like yeah. Regardless of what happens, I'm committing yeah. to the situation. So we're now in a phase where you start your story starts to take an uptick. Yeah. So there's a quote that reads, you know, it takes four weeks for you to notice a difference, eight weeks for your family and friends, and then like your 12 weeks people you don't really know to take, take notice of you changing. When do you feel better about yourself? It was a vivid memory of wearing what I had at that point, a Superman shirt. Um, everyone's seen the Superman movie where Clark Kent obviously busts mm. off the shirt mm. and then the giant S is on his chest, right. um, which is a symbol of hope for the, all the people that are watching the movies. But for me, in that moment, I just remember having that shirt on and it was just so well-fitting. Um, okay. Because it had all the right nooks and crannies. It got the, the muscle showing, the pecs are looking good. Yeah, and I was still insecure at that point, but I was getting good feedback. Mm. And because of the journey, I, I didn't know what positive reinforcement looked like. So It's intense. Yeah. Being able to have that shirt on and see that everything fit. Yeah. And that I could, I had a confident uh, demeanor to myself. Yeah. I felt good in my skin. And the, the comments that I was receiving from family and other people was just a continuation of that. So that was a, that was the first pat on the back for yeah. committing more than anything. Cause as a kid, you really, you're very impressionable. Mm. And I had no idea what committing and following through looked like until I did it. Um, so I look back and I tell myself that I'm just glad I did it. I think that's, that's an intriguing point. Um, the part that I want to focus on is, and this is a part that people often overlook, just because you've now lost the weight and you look fantastic in what you're wearing or you look, you're very, you know, you mark the aesthetically pleasing body goals that you see on social media, that doesn't just mean that your body dysmorphia has disappeared. You still have that. Yeah. You know, you're now many years later. I'm I'm jumping to the future here, but mm-hmm. is this something you still have on your mind, or is it have you now kind of worked through that body dysmorphia? I'd say that it's a challenge I choose to stay positive on, um, because any journey of self improvement mm-hmm. it requires a lot of accountability and transparency. If I'm doing the accountability metrics of doing that workout, going yeah. for that run, having a tea and with with honey instead of a biscuit. And then I can see the results when I look myself in the mirror. And I've had moments where the body dysmorphia has made me not ac- not actualize and not accept that there have been improvements. There have been subtle and yeah. massive changes. But I always say that I have to stay positive because the world is already negative as mm. is. And I need to be my number one support system. So if I maintain a positive frame towards all the inputs that I'm giving, the output will be a positive one. Mm. Uh, that, that, I mean, that, that's a nice takeaway. Um, the Superman shirt, mm-hmm. what age was this? I was talking about young adult, like yeah. just on the cusp of 18, 19? Yeah, or... around there. Because um, at that point I trained and I committed fully for 16 to 18 months. Um, and then as school's finishing, um, I'm starting to grow into my body. Mm-hmm. So. I remember I was, I turned 18 at the end of the year when everyone was already... Oh, uh, I see. So, yeah, that, that, that counts. Yeah. People don't think so, yeah, but that counts. It all culminated, mm. um, and I only saw what that looked like two years down the line. Mm. Um, so it was, a, it was a surreal experience. Now, a very defining experience, but it seems like you, you turned around for the positive. Mm. The part that I find intriguing is that the body dysmorphia that you felt growing up, and then your outlet being health, working out, um, exercise, and just being, being healthy, uh, being your focal point. And that changing your identity in the process, you know, we talk about the time you wore the Superman shirt and you felt really good in yourself, getting all these compliments. And you continue to exercise and you continue to chase the, the fitness industry. And it's obviously, it makes sense because it's giving you so much confidence and motivation. Mm-hmm. But 
we now get to a point where take your first knock. What, to, so people don't know, what, what is this first knock that, that I'm talking about? Um, so I had a stint where I ended up in hospital and basically I was in crutches and I ended up in a wheelchair. It was what I thought it would be just a routine checkup and intervention turned out to be a long dragged out process. And during that time, I was given access to painkillers. And I always thought that what a doctor tells you to take, you take and you never question. So I've taken the prescriptions, but I'm not seeing improvement. Um, my health is just not improving and I'm losing my body. I'm losing all of the great things that I've achieved with my body. Mm -hmm. I'm losing my mental strength. And basically, I, I developed a substance addiction to these painkillers. And what got me through it was my family, because they identified that I wasn't myself. Mm -hmm. They said that I became obviously dependent on these substances. And they said that more than anything, you need to be able to make the mental shift. Was this the, was it this the same time when the doctor told you you'll never walk in, or was this the first knee injury you had? First knee injury. Uh, okay, so even then already you were in a wheelchair. Yeah. And because, like on crutches in a wheelchair, trying to just. Yeah. Okay, that I didn't know. That's actually crazy. So that 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 injury was so bad. How how long would that that first injury last? The time frame was supposed to be four to twelve weeks. Um, ended up being sixteen to twenty four weeks. And I've always said that with knees, everyone's knees can go, but your, your trauma will be different to the next guy. Mm. So for me, what was diagnosed as an ACL was not even a meniscus tear. It was just a very badly sprained knee. And the painkillers that were supposed to alleviate the pain to a point where we could actually see the progress, or yeah. no progress, were kind of blocking out and filtering the damage. Can you run me through the accident again? What, what actually happened? Um, my first knee injury was during soccer again. Um, what would have been a normal and straightforward tackle, I just went in and I just felt my knee go. Uh, there was a lot of pain. Uh, what turned out to be what I thought was it would have been an MCL or an ACL. Um, the doctors at first assumed the worst, so they're like, well, until your knee is calm back down, we need you to put you on anti-inflammatories, which were painkillers, and then we'll have a look at what that looks like in the next 24 to 48 hours. And then basically my knees swelled down, obviously, but they couldn't pick up the injury. Um, they kept saying that we assume it's this. Um, my family was very good at saying that if you can't give us clarity on what exactly is going on, he's not going under the knife. And I was just in a lot of pain. So usually with knee injuries of that sort, ACL, MCL, the whole procedure takes four weeks of immediate recovery and then it's eight to 12 weeks of just learning and teaching your body to trust your knee and to be able to load and etc. etc. For me, what that looked like is that I was given painkillers but without the prescribed dosage, it was more of a blanket statement of you're going to take this much until you feel something. And we assume that at this point you should be able to recover. I just never got to that point. Um, mm. And I just remember feeling that at this point I'd, I've gone through a journey of obviously improving the way that I feel about myself, but I'm not doing much about my body at this point. I'm just sitting Mm. Um, and my knee is obviously not in a good place and I just was starting to see the the nightmares of what I used to look like and how I used to feel about myself and it was just it was a hard process um, yeah it sounds like a miserable process I can imagine that what the, the part that I can't believe is that they offer you medication but they don't tell you what the appropriate dose should be for this period of time so were you just kind of gut feeling it out? Like you, you took enough to make sure you weren't feeling much pain? Yeah. Um, and then that's, that, that was the first mistake because you're, I'm a kid. I'm only in young 20s. I, I, I have, have used, obviously, anti-inflammatories, but they gave me the strongest stuff that I've ever experienced. And I was told to obviously carry on with the 
medication without much of a guideline on to the dosage and mm -hmm. all of that. Uh, what that looks like is taking a pill in the morning with your meal, lunch with your meal, and evening with your meal. So yeah, I was given this anti-inflammatory medication and I was told to take it without much of a mm -hmm. direction um, or prescription. It was more take it as you feel. And what I quickly realized is that I was not myself. Um, I would, at that point, I, would, I used to be an active person that I had basically active habits mm -hmm. and just being able to sit with my body and not being able to do much was starting to play on my mind quite heavily. I started to see the version of myself that I didn't identify with when mm -hmm. I was overweight in my younger teenage years. So it was it became very much a challenging period. My family, while they were supportive of my of my recovery, they also started to see the changes and at one point they just said that you're not making an improvement. Mm -hmm. um, you need to stop taking these painkillers or scale down the dosage. Right. Um, because at one point, I just remember days would just, I would just not feel like myself. Yeah. So, and this is interesting, because I was always wondering, how does one develop... Like, in, how do I develop a problem where you start to abuse painkillers? Like, because what, what is it that's driving this? For me, it was the wanting the pain to go away um, and thinking that the numbing feeling is part of that process mm. until the numbing feeling was what I craved. That's it, difficult. Yeah, because mm. it's not a headache tablet where you take it, you sleep it off, and you can roll it, roll it off. I was told that to be able to build a tolerance for it I needed to ingest this much mm. and should things get worse take more so mm. I became very exposed to That's something tough. yeah very strongly and then my body obviously adapted to it so it was just scaling it back that turned out to be quite difficult so how what did that look like scaling it back how did you get over this issue I started waking up in the mornings feeling heavier and so much so that my appetite wasn't there Mm -hmm. But I would, I would force myself to eat and take these painkillers. So if I did that in the morning, I'd tell myself I'm not going to eat in the evening. Um, I'd take one in the morning, one for lunch, and I'd just allow my body to digest that because I would just feel bloated as well. Okay. The idea that I have to have three meals a day and I'm just sitting, mm -hmm. it was starting to affect my productivity. And, that, and that's so the body is more you're saying, look, you've, you've had enough, don't eat anymore. Yeah. You don't want to go back where you are. Yeah. But how, how did you scale off from the actual painkillers? Like, how did you get to a point where you stopped taking them? Because, I mean, if they were so, you know, if you're, if you're abusing them, like, how do you get away from, because they, they, they actually capture you, yeah. you know, like they grip you. I just told my dad that something is wrong and he said that instead of taking the dosage that you're on, mm -hmm. why don't we try just allowing you to wake up and go through the first bit of your day without the painkiller until you need it. Mm -hmm. um, and I would take one in the evening with my last meal, sleep, wake up in the morning and at first it was hard to be able to say, okay, I'm not going to take this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to resist the urge to obviously do it. Um, and it, it, took, it took a while. I'm not going to lie and say that happened overnight, but it yeah. was having to teach myself and having to exert some kind of self-control. Obviously, my folks did their part in saying that mm -hmm. this is the painkiller that you're taking today. Um, we will give you one at a time when we see fit. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, that's how, uh, how we went about it. But yeah. Would you say that's a, an, an advice that you give to some other parents listening in, that if they see this happening, mm -hmm. that they should try take control of the... The dosing, yeah. just manage it and take it out of your hands because you're a child at the time, you know. Okay. Um, you also don't know better, but I mean, I'd say I say that, and at the same time, you got the doctors not giving you a better know-how either. Yeah. So maybe them just trying to help and take a bit of charge is that one of the key things that you recommend? I'd say that the parent knows their their children better than the doctor. Um, the doctor sees a thousand people, and he mm -hmm. has to give what's consistent on eighty percent of those people. Um, the twenty percent, what that looks like. He just doesn't have the time to be able to give that person the care specific to them. So my parents identified that and they just saw that 
for what I was before the painkillers mm -hmm. and what I was during the painkillers were two different people and they took action. I like that. Yeah. Sounds like you had a really great support system growing up. I'd like to think so, yeah. Yeah. The, the intriguing part that you mentioned that I, I, I think is, is so key is when you have a condition, a health condition, whatever it is, I like that you, you mentioned a doctor, listening to just one doctor and just one opinion isn't the end all be all. Get more opinions if you can. You know, maybe get some opinions that aren't just from doctors, but maybe some other variants of health practitioners. Mm -hmm. So we will get to this later, but we spoke about a physio who was immensely helpful in your journey to recovery. But had you, had you not gone to a physio or like a, a sports scientist, that would have been a huge gap in your development getting back to normal. So you obviously need specialists. And the thing that I like to advocate to people is that when you have a health condition, I think you should become the expert in that. You can't expect um, to just rely on on a doctor. You should also do your own research and 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 bring that to your doctor and have the discussions and challenge them, because it's your it's your condition, something you're living with. You also know your body, and like you said, if your parents know their child. Now, this is the big one. What happened? I was at home. I was getting ready for work. Um, and then I'm in the kitchen with my family. A piece of glass drops on the floor and basically cuts my foot and severs one of my tendons. There's a massive bloodbath. I don't realize what's going on in the moment. My mom is in shock. My brothers are too scared to look. And once we clean up, and what that looks like is that I'm, I just don't feel like myself struggling to put what's it, my weight on my left hand side. We end up in a hospital and we obviously there's a specialist that looks at me and a doctor, he cleans me up, he does what he's doing, he gives me stitches and he says that, okay, everything is handled, mm -hmm. you're fine, cool. Um, but I just distinctly remember a feeling that I couldn't move my left thumb or like on my foot. Um, or like your big toe, yeah. you couldn't move it. Yeah. Um, and the doctor just looks at me, looks at my mom, and then looks again at my at my foot, and then he sees that my tendon was actually severed. But I mean, this is insane. Like you, a glass, what is it on? Was it on the counter? Explain to me, because I mean, it's a freak accident. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, um, there was just a bowl that was next to me. Um, I knocked it walking by. It shattered into uh, however many pieces. Mm -hmm. And this was all in split seconds. And it was one of those innocuous things that just happened. So, so wait, okay, so I, I, probably, I don't want to harbor on this, yeah. but it's just so crazy to me. So like, does the glass shatter yeah. and the glass ricochets into your foot or do you stand on the glass? The glass just snips the top of my foot. Okay, cuts right through. Cuts See, it's, right it's crazy. Often you don't think about glass being, I know, obviously I know it's sharp, I'm not yeah. an idiot, but... You don't think about that that can happen off something falling off the counter? Yeah. Uh, and severing a tendon, which is huge. So someone who doesn't know what that means, explain to them what does it mean if you sever a tendon in your foot? Uh, basically, there's one big connection in your fingers, in your toes, in your neck. Um, and if you had to grab a piece of string or a noodle and just cut it off, it will just, whatever is being held up will just fall. And huh. the other part will just stay in that position. So basically, the part that was connecting my, um, what's it called, my toe to the rest of my foot, that was allowing motion, it was completely severed off. And the doctor initially didn't think it was a severed tendon? He didn't give the attention that he needed to. Um, it's simple Did you feel that at the time, or was it just in hindsight when you thought about it? In the moment, I, I was very present of, or cognitive of what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I just remember, I've always known how my body feels. Yeah. And my body was telling me that something's wrong. And the way that the doctor went about it was if it was just a... a cut. Know, yeah, just another situation that just needed this much care mm. handled, ready to go on to the next one. But I had to stop him and actually said that, listen, Whatever you've done, I can't move my toe. Yeah. And that's when he obviously put away the facade and actually gave me proper care mm -hmm. and 
once he was it, he deducted that I needed serious attention. He looked at my mom, looked at me, and then made the call to put me in for an operation. Okay. Yeah. So you come out the operation, and what do they tell you? Family walks in, doctor walks in, yeah. and it's the post-surgery conversation. Everything went according to plan. And, okay, then I'm asking the doctor and I'm asking my dad, okay, how long am I out for? What, yeah. what are our next steps? Because my mind is going towards how do we build the next however long until right. we're... Right, when how do I recover from this? Yeah. And get back to normal. Yeah, um, and then the doctor says that to my dad and myself in the moment, um, you may not be able to walk again. You may not be able to run again. We are going to have to see on a case-by-case -case basis how you recover because usually tendons come with a lot of restricted motion. Mm -hmm. So there's every chance that what you used to do, you won't be able to do again. And in that moment, I'm shattered. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, because up until this moment, I just thought that it would be a normal day. I'm about to go to work. Yeah. Um, I'm about to just nod into the kitchen and leave. Next thing you know, 24 hours later, someone's telling me, I'm not going to be able to walk again. Um, what what happens now? You obviously leave the hospital at some point, yeah? And you're now in a, in a wheelchair. I think I remember you telling me this. How, how long are you in this wheelchair for? Um, so they gave me a timeline of three months mm -hmm. because they wanted to see how my tendon would respond. Um, I ended up being in the wheelchair for what looked like six months. Oh. Uh, Very similar to your first injury. Yeah, yeah. Uh, simply because I took the news from the doctor quite, quite seriously. Hard. Yeah, mm. um, I, I just remember sitting in my room thinking of all the scenarios, all the things I used to take for granted, mm -hmm. just being able to go for a run, walk to the gym, walk to the bathroom. I needed assistance to do that mm. for a year. And I thought to myself, because you would always look internally for answers yeah. instead of externally. So I was just questioning a lot of things. And in that fourth month of that six month journey, my dad looked at me and he said that, well, I can tell you that uh, in terms of the procedure, the doctor did his job, so you should be healed. But right now you are telling yourself that you're still sick. You're telling yourself that you're still, you're still suffering from what has happened to you. You're telling yourself that you're the victim. And he said that some injuries you have to recover from mentally. And in the beginning, I didn't know what that meant. Um, it was, it just so happened that the Paralympics were on TV. So I had something to distract myself with. And I saw people that weren't able-bodied, that had more serious things happen to them in life. And they were absolutely crushing it on the mm. world stage and doing incredible things. And then I thought to myself, well, if they can do these great things and they're still showing up and they're still managing to overcome what they faced, then maybe my dad's onto something regarding this whole injuries or mental mm. uh, process. So then if you were to package this, this story, this journey of yours, yeah. in a, into a, a pocket of advice, you know, what, what advice would you give another person going through something like this where they people of authority are telling them one thing and they need to try to overcome that what what yeah what advice would you give them I would say that don't always trust what's being told to you um, listen to your inner gut and you mentioned about becoming an expert and educating yourself the reason why I dealt with what I dealt with was because I had an inner voice telling me that there is a way mm. um that inner voice manifested through my family, thankfully, because they were able to be my support and my anchor to say that whatever you're doing, you need to change it. So get off the painkillers. You need to mentally want to recover from your injuries. And most people don't have access to that. So having that support structure is massive. Um, I believe that that's the reason I'm still able to do the things that I'm able to do but also having that intuition to know that you can do better, you can recover, and you can amount to a lot of good things. Because this was in the period of, let's say, 2012 to 2016, 18, um, from the, obviously the whole 
being bullied as a teenager mm -hmm. to the injuries. And I say that in that period, I didn't have access to the tools that a lot of people have online. I didn't know that, you know, wanting to become better and look after your fitness and, you know, work out and, you know, improve your mental state. Those are things that are called self-improvement today. I didn't know that because I didn't have access to these things. Um, and these, they are all good examples of what that looks like. Yeah. Um, so always identify that for yourself. It could be in your immediate reality, it could be online and find those communities online that support those kinds of improvements and changes. So that's what I would want to recommend for people, for mm -hmm. parents, I would say that just always, always support, but always know when to intervene. Okay. Uh, it's easier said than done. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's what got me out of a difficult situation. Yeah. Love that. Well, look, thank you very much, Kevin. This was a, it was a great story. Thank you so much for the opportunity.